You're listening to The Jacob Volk Show. He's breaking down the latest and greatest in sports as only he can. Follow him on Twitter at Real Jacob Falk. Here he is, Jacob Ball. Hey, sports fans, welcome to another edition of the Jacob Volk Show. I am the Jacob Volk, except no imitation. Obviously, today is MLK Day, the perfect day to sit back and reflect on the legacy of one of the greatest men To ever walk the face of the earth. I say this about Memorial Day. And I say this about Veterans Day. We shouldn't need a special day for someone like him. We should always think about his outstanding legacy. And what he did to further the civil rights movement. But look, this is not a history podcast. Maybe it's a little bit of a sports history podcast. But it is a sports talk podcast. So I've got to start with the five NFL playoff games that we saw over the weekend I'll go chronologically. I think that's the best way to do it. I thought about putting the great games first and then the bad games last, but no, I think chronologically is the right way to go. That means I get to start with a great game, raiders Bengals. It is pretty sad that we got two great games and three lousy games. Hopefully tonight's game is great. I think it will be. But it is pretty bad when you can turn off an NFL game in the first half. You remember what I said the key for the Bengals was? They couldn't let the bright lights get to them. This is a young team with a young head coach, a young quarterback, a young number one wide receiver, a young running back, even a young defense for the most part. I was a little scared that the bright lights would get to the Bengals. I mean, this is a team that hadn't won a playoff game in over 30 years. You're carrying that burden with you. If you're Zach Taylor or Joe Burrow or Jamar Chase, whether you like it or not. Now, I didn't think they would be scared of the bright lights. Joe Burrow played in a national title game and was fantastic, so... That's pretty good practice. I mean, the young guns stepped up. With the exception of Joe Mixon, the Bengals' young guns stepped up. Burrow was fantastic. Jamar Chase was really good. I thought Zach Taylor called a really good game. Very strong game for the Bengals. The Bengals' defense made Derek Carr work. Carr turned the ball over twice. No Raiders pass catcher eclipsed 76 yards. 
it wasn't a great game for the Raiders' offense. And this is a team that doesn't have a great playoff history. They haven't won a playoff game since the 2 season. They've only been in the playoffs twice since then. Remember when the Raiders were an absolute laughingstock? Remember when they went through a million coaches in a very short period of time? Here's a list of all the Raiders coaches from 2003 to 2014. Bill Callahan, Norv Turner, Art Shell, Lane Kiffin, Tom Cable, Hugh Jackson, Dennis Allen, and Tony Sperano. That's eight coaches in 12 seasons. Look, they seem to have righted that ship a little bit, but the Raiders don't have a good playoff history either. I was focusing too much on the Bengals. Should have brought up the Raiders also. As for the game itself, the first big moment was the Trey Hendrickson strip sack recovered by Larry Ogunjobi. You gotta wonder what Greg Olson was thinking calling a play where Foster Moreau is one-on-one against Trey Hendrickson. There are some offensive linemen that have trouble with Trey Hendrickson one-on-one. You're going to trust Foster Moreau, a tight end, And not even a great tight end. Someone who had just a 52.8 pass blocking grade this year, according to Pro Football Focus. That guy's going up against Trey Hendrickson one-on-one. Trey Hendrickson had 14 sacks this year. Yeah, that's not going to end well. The Bengals are up 7-3 at this point. A touchdown, and you're feeling really good about their chances. But give the Raiders credit, they did hold. The Bengals went 3 and out. The Raiders kept it a one-score game. Even when the Bengals had first and goal at the six-yard line, the Raiders held. So instead of it being 21-3, to it's 13-3. to It actually became 13-6 to at one point. And then we had an incredibly controversial play. We're at the two-minute warning, third and four, at the ten-and-a-half-yard line. Burrow drops back, then steps up in the pocket. He's looking touchdown. He rolls right to buy time. He comes dangerously close to stepping out of bounds. Live time. I actually thought he did step out of bounds. But Burrow did stay in bounds and threw a strike to Tyler Boyd for a touchdown. The thing is, though, right before Boyd caught that ball, a whistle was blown. Presumably, the official thought that Burrow stepped out of bounds. Then, after a discussion, it was determined that it was a touchdown. But a whistle was blown. There is no question about it. 
Did it impact the play? The Raiders will say yes. Personally, I don't think so. The whistle was so late that I just don't see how it impacted the play. I mean, watch the video. I really don't think it impacted the play. But that's irrelevant. A whistle was blown. Even if after a discussion, it's determined that Burrow didn't step out of bounds, that touchdown doesn't count. It's an inadvertent whistle. What happens on an inadvertent whistle? The play is dead. We redo it. After the game, the officials said that the whistle was blown after Boyd caught the ball. Are you kidding me? Everyone in the building knew that was nonsense. Watching it live, I knew that was nonsense. I heard the whistle. So it verified my initial thought that Burrow had stepped out of bounds. But the ball was still in flight. The officiating in that game was, without question, absolutely dreadful. They looked like the replacement refs out there. It was a joke. Jerome Boger should be ashamed of himself because he is better than that. You want to tell me logically that's the right call? If the whistle being blown didn't impact the play, just let the play stand? I understand that from a logic perspective. The thing is, though, that's not the rule. Where in the NFL rulebook does it say anything about referees using their noodles? If you're an official, you have to call the game by the letter of the law. By the convoluted set of instructions that is the NFL rulebook. And the rule is, if a whistle was blown for no good reason, the play is dead. We go back and we redo third and four. To say that the whistle was blown after Boyd caught the ball is just nonsense. And realize, that did cost the Raiders the game. The final score was 26-19. You want to tell me the Bengals would have scored anyway? They would have kicked a field goal or they would have gotten a touchdown anyway? Well, we don't know that. Odds are they would have gotten at least three points, but stranger things have happened. If you're a Raiders fan, you have a right to be upset about how that play unfolded. Now, the Raiders did make it a one-score game right before the half. Give Derek Carr a ton of credit. He went 80 yards in 98 seconds. Then it became a field goal fest. Both teams combined for eight field goals. That's tied for the most in a playoff game in the 21st century. Evan McPherson and Daniel Carlson both kicked four field goals. They didn't miss any kicks. They were fantastic. Give them credit. Now the Raiders had a chance to tie or win this game late. Probably tie. Were they helped by an absolutely dreadful roughing the passer call? The answer is yes. 
On no planet is that roughing the passer. Whatever happened to... In a situation like that, a two-minute drill... Down by one score, unless it's egregious, you don't call it. You can't gift the Raiders 15 yards... Did it matter at the end of the day? No, but come on. That's no excuse. Like I said, the officiating was horrendous. I will say this, though. The football gods, even the playing field, when Carr completed 3rd and 17 to Darren Waller. You know the ball is going to either Darren Waller or Hunter Renfro. And you have single coverage on Waller over the middle of the field? Bad job by Lou Anarumo there. Although overall he did call a really good game. More than anything, that's probably on Trey Flowers. He wasn't in bad position or anything. He just didn't execute. I don't know why the safeties were playing so deep, but more than anything, that was just a really good throw by Carr, really good catch by Waller, bad job by Trey Flowers, but that really was all she wrote. On first and goal, the Bengals stepped up. The Raiders had fourth and goal, and Carr threw a pass short of the end zone that was picked off by Jermaine Pratt. Game's over. Bengals win 26-19. Their first playoff win in over 30 years. You've got to be really happy for them. If you don't have a rooting interest in these playoffs, it's very easy to get behind the Bengals. A team that hadn't won a playoff game in over 30 years? That's insane. A team that's never won a Super Bowl? A team that the last time it was in one fell victim to Joe Montana. Actually fell victim to Montana twice. I think out of all the teams that are still alive in the playoffs, the easiest team to get behind is the Bengals. Maybe the Cardinals but more so the Bengals. Moving on now to Patriots Bills. Nothing made me happier this weekend than seeing the Patriots get creamed. I have said this before. I will say it again. Out of the three Jets' division rivals, I hate the Dolphins the most, the Patriots the second most, and even then there's not a big gap between the Bills and the Patriots, but there is a big gap between the Patriots and the Bills. In fact, the Giants are probably between the Patriots and the Bills. Oh, how sweet it was to watch the Bills go up 27-0. Oh, how sweet it was to see Josh Allen have a basically perfect game and see Micah Hyde make that big interception beautifully done by him. You know, I didn't think that the bright lights would get to Jones. I mean, he's a Patriot, national champion, played for Alabama. 
He's been in the spotlight almost his whole life. I mean, he was a baby Gap model at one point. But he looked really bad. He was trying to force stuff. And when Jones is trying to air the ball out, that's when the Patriots will suffer because he's not that quarterback. He's a game manager. You can trust him to make the short passes and the intermediate passes. You can trust him to read a defense and to put his personnel in the best position possible. But at the end of the day, life on the line, there are a lot of quarterbacks that I want quarterbacking my team than Mac Jones. Make no mistake about it, the Patriots dynasty is dead. I'm not saying that the Patriots are going to be dreadful now. Alright, I'm not saying they're going to fall off a cliff, but as far as making the Super Bowl goes, as far as making the AFC title game goes, I don't see that happening anytime soon. From 2011 to 2018, the Patriots made at least the AFC title game every year. Look, that's a run of dominance that we'll most likely never see again. Maybe the Chiefs, maybe the Bills, but that's tough. That's eight straight years of winning at least one playoff game. That's very tough to do. The Patriots aren't going to get anywhere near that with Mac Jones. You want to tell me you're not expecting that? It's unfair to expect him to be Brady? Okay, fair enough, but I'll even go a step further. Mac Jones will not be the quarterback for multiple New England Patriots teams that make the AFC title game. Game managers don't do that. And that's all Jones is. He's a game manager. Maybe you don't care if you win, all right? I totally get that. Doesn't matter how you win. It just matters if you win. I totally get that. But there are some games where you want your quarterback to put your team on his back and lead you to victory. The Patriots defense, this great Patriots defense, couldn't stop Josh Allen to save their lives. He completed 21 of 25 passes for 308 yards and five touchdowns. So it's up to the quarterback in that spot to say, it's all right, I'll keep us in a great position to win this game. He did not do that. The Patriots looked dead to the world in this game. There was a story that came out that said that Josh McDaniels isn't getting interview requests. After that performance, I see why. Personally, I think there's a handshake deal in place with the Patriots where Josh McDaniels will take over for Belichick. And we know it's not going to be next year. Belichick said he's going to be back. Maybe the year after? I don't know. But I do think that handshake deal is in place. I have no sources on that. That's just my sense. 
But make no mistake about it. If the Patriots want to be among the elite of the elite again, it's not going to be with Mac Jones as their starting quarterback. He's just not that guy. He's a game manager. That's all he is. Moving on now to Eagles Buccaneers. It's kind of funny. The highlight of this game may be something that Troy Aikman said. He, in essence, said that he'd rather be in Dallas than in Tampa. Can you blame him? I mean, the Eagles looked worse than the Patriots did. The Buccaneers could do whatever they wanted to the Eagles. This was an evisceration of epic proportions. You can't let Giovanni Bernard and Keyshawn Vaughn both get rushing touchdowns. I mean, there was a point when the Buccaneers had 137 total yards. You know how many total yards the Eagles had at that point? 15. You can get that on one play. You can get that on a roughing the passer penalty, for goodness sake. Don't let the score fool you. This game was a rout. The Buccaneers were up 31 to nothing at one point. Jalen Hurts had two interceptions. They did a terrible job of utilizing Devontae Smith. Troy Aikman said that on the broadcast. He was 100% right. If the Buccaneers are playing deep, have Devontae Smith run a short route and see what he can do with the ball in his hands. The way that game was going, Jalen Hurts was not going to win you that game. It could have been Devontae Smith. It could have been Dallas Goddard. I mean, not for nothing, but the Eagles were only down 17 nothing at the half. It's not impossible to come back from that. Not likely, but not impossible. What we really learned here is that the Eagles were just pretenders. 9-2 against non-playoff teams, but 0-7 versus playoff teams. That's inexcusable. To not win a single game against a playoff team, it just shows that while the Eagles may not have been dreadful, They weren't exactly really, really good either. I mean, I'm skeptical of Jalen Hurts' future. The guy only had 16 passing touchdowns this year. Not great. He's better than I thought he would be. No question. But that still doesn't make him great. As for the Buccaneers, it's kind of funny. My mom said to me, Oh, Jacob, you must be so upset seeing Brady win again. Now that Brady's a Buccaneer, I don't care. In fact, I'm happy that he's advancing further than the Patriots. The hatred was never of Brady as a person. The hatred was of him as a patriot. It's like Jerry Seinfeld said, we root for laundry. If Tom Brady was a Jet, I'd love him. If Rob Gronkowski was a Jet, I'd love him. If Bill Belichick had stayed with the Jets, I'd love him. If Julian Edelman was a Jet, I'd love him. Now that Brady's a Buccaneer... He can win all he wants. All right, now on to the craziest game of the weekend. 
And the only game I got wrong, by the way, I went 4-1 and one in my picks. Good job by me. Niners-Cowboys. I picked all the home teams. I didn't do that on purpose. That's just how it shook out. And you know what? Ultimately, I'll take 4-1. and one. From the outset, it really looked like the Niners were the better team. Which surprised the daylights out of me. I mean, before you could blink. The Niners were up 13 to nothing. And the Cowboys had only run nine plays. They only had one first down. And they only had 17 total yards. It really looked like this was going to be a rout. Then Prescott threw that touchdown pass To Amari Cooper, beautiful throw. And it's like, okay, we've got a game here. We did have some great moments, though. We had Robbie Gold extend his record of perfection in the playoffs. He's now 18 for 18. Those are the most field goals hit by a kicker in the postseason. Out of all the kickers in NFL history to never miss a playoff field goal. We had Cedric Wilson lose the ball in the sun because of course he did. If you're going to build a billion-dollar stadium, why would you make it sunproof? That makes sense. And if you're going to build the world's biggest jumbotron, why on earth would you do it in such a way that it's going to block punts? Come on! This isn't the first time this has happened, either! It's just so dumb. You build this incredible stadium that everyone likes. I've never heard anyone say a bad thing about it from a spectator perspective, but from a football perspective, it's just... A joke, some of the things that happen. Now, even though the Cowboys got off the schneid, it was still all Niners. Prescott threw an interception. Then on the next play, Debo Samuel ran the ball in for a touchdown. It's 23-7 Niners at this point. After three quarters, you're thinking there's no way the Cowboys are going to come back. But the Cowboys did have some life. They converted on a crazy fake punt. It gave the Cowboys some momentum. Then all that momentum got taken away. For whatever reason, the Cowboys special teams unit stayed on the field. It looked like they were trying to force the Niners to take a timeout. The Niners didn't bite. Then with 20 seconds left on the play clock, the offense comes back out. I just don't understand why you're trying to get cute like that. It makes absolutely no sense. Now, I'll say this from a rules perspective. I don't know why the official was standing by the football like that. The only thing that I can think of... 
is that when the personnel switches like that, the official needs to spot the ball. But he did wait a while to do that. It wasn't the greatest thing I've ever seen, but it was more on the Cowboys for getting cute like that. It didn't really matter because the Cowboys still got points. They forced Jimmy Garoppolo into making a bad throw. Of course, Jimmy Garoppolo's going to have that moment where he makes a bad play because he's not a great quarterback. Not terrible, but not great. Then you see the great quarterback in Prescott make a really, really smart play. Realize that no one's guarding against the run. He runs in for the touchdown. Cowboys are only down by six. Then you saw the stupidest end to a game you'll ever see. It's second and one with 14 seconds left. Neither team has any timeouts left. What's the last thing on earth you should do if you're Dak Prescott? Put the ball in the middle of the field. You need to get out of bounds there, right? Yeah. You need to stop the clock. It's okay if you want to run one more play. 14 seconds, you have time. But it needs to get out of bounds. You don't call something that puts the ball in the middle of the field. Now, I don't know if this was a called quarterback run or if Prescott just did it himself. I'll say this. On a called quarterback run, you'd think you'd see the wide receivers blocking, right? None of the wide receivers were blocking. That may have been Prescott taking off by himself. And the Niners were more than happy to let him do it. Sure. We'll let you run the ball and slide and stay in bounds. That keeps the clock running. Prescott gets up with Six seconds left on the clock. There is no way that in six seconds you can spike the ball. There's just no way. Then you saw the implementation of a rule that you never see. The umpire has to spot the ball. He has to touch the ball and spot it correctly in order for the next play to occur. That's why you see players in those situations look around for the umpire. Prescott didn't do that. He spotted the ball himself. So the umpire comes running in and says, wait a minute, you can't do that, I need to do it, I need to push the ball back a little bit, by the time he gets through that sea of bodies, there are three zeros on the clock. Look, I don't know for sure if that was a designed quarterback run, or if Prescott took off himself. I find it very hard to believe that he would take off himself, but you look at the receivers, they're gearing up for a pass. It just doesn't seem like that's something 
that would happen if it was a designed quarterback run. Now, let me say this. Shame on Dak Prescott and shame on Mike McCarthy for their post-game comments. Prescott sanctioning the Cowboys fans throwing stuff at the officials. McCarthy saying he thought that the officials would let them play more. Are you kidding me? The Cowboys had the most penalties out of any team in the NFL. They had 127. Second was the Raiders at 124. Let me ask you something. Was there a penalty called against the Cowboys that you can look back at and say that should not have been called? I can't. I can honestly say that every penalty that the officials called was correct. The Cowboys were called for 14 penalties. And you know what? I think the officials got it right 14 times. To insinuate that the officials cost you this game is classless. Look yourself in the mirror. Here's a crazy idea. Maybe Randy Gregory shouldn't commit a stupid holding penalty. That took a lot of time off the clock. That probably cost the Cowboys the game more than anything. That holding penalty. That absolutely was a hold. The Cowboys are a joke. This was my Dark Horse Super Bowl team. Oh, God, I feel like an idiot. And you can't say it's okay for the fans to throw stuff at the officials. All right, I understand that Prescott thought that Cowboys fans were throwing stuff at the team. So I guess it's better than that. Like, if you're the Cowboys quarterback, you don't want your fans... To throw stuff at you and your teammates. Alright, that is the worst case scenario. I get that. So maybe it's better that that debris was targeted for the officials. But you can't say it like that. When you find out that it was directed for the officials, just say, oh, okay, and move on. If pressed for a follow-up, just say, I'm glad that it wasn't directed toward me and my brothers. It shouldn't happen at all, but at least it wasn't directed toward my team. Instead, the Cowboys just proved why they're a joke. 11 straight playoff appearances without reaching a conference title game. That's the longest streak in NFL history. And this was my dark horse? Like I said, I feel like an idiot. The Cowboys are a joke. Jerry Jones needs to get to the bottom of this. I'll say this, if you want to fire Mike McCarthy, I'm okay with it. Remember when the Jets hired Adam Gase? Someone else who they really liked was Mike McCarthy. I never wanted McCarthy. I liked Gase, so I got that wrong. But I hated McCarthy. I got that right. If this guy didn't have great quarterbacks like Aaron Rodgers and Dak Prescott, we'd look at him as the second coming of Rich Kotite. I'll say this, if you're not going to fire McCarthy, and I understand that it's hard to fire a coach after a 12-5 and season, even though it ended as badly as a season possibly can, you've got to fire the offensive coordinator. You had a high opinion of Kellen Moore, you implored Mike McCarthy to keep him, 
He did. And look, the Cowboys have a great offense. There's no question. But I think it's clear that changes need to be made. You can't fire the defensive coordinator. Dan Quinn has turned that defense around. The only thing you can do is fire Kellen Moore. If you want to fire McCarthy, I'm okay with that. I'm not going to sit here and say that's what should definitely happen, but I'd be okay with it. But the Cowboys should definitely fire Kellen Moore. Changes need to be made in Dallas. It's just that simple. Moving on now to Steelers Chiefs. Both teams looked really bad through the first Quarter and a half, a lot of three and outs. We had a Mahomes interception. We had a fumble return for a touchdown. I mean, it was funny. Al Michaels and Chris Collinsworth were saying, hey, the Steelers must be feeling really good right about now. Eh? Like, yeah, you were limiting Mahomes, I totally get that, but your offense wasn't clicking. That's the thing, like, Roethlisberger didn't click until late. It's great that you're limiting Mahomes, but that's only half the battle. You've got to score also. Otherwise, it's just 0-0. Zero, zero. So, yeah, you had to feel good about your defense if you were a Steelers fan. But the offense wasn't getting anything going. And at the end of the day, you've got to score if you want to win. I mean, that fumble return touchdown just ticked the Chiefs off. Like, after that, it was all Chiefs. At one point, the Chiefs were up 35-7. Mahomes could do no wrong. He ended up throwing for over 400 yards and five touchdowns. I mean, this game was a rout. Give Roethlisberger credit. The final stat line wasn't awful. He completed 29 of 44 passes for 215 yards and two touchdowns. If this is his last game, and it seems like it will be, he went out with his head held high. That's all you can ask for. It's nice that his career ended in the playoffs. There's no shame in losing to Mahomes. You really don't have anything to be upset about if you're a Steelers fan. Yeah, you got outplayed, but that's what was supposed to happen. What, you wanted to lose closer? A loss is a loss. It really doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things. Do the Chiefs look like a world beater? No, definitely not, but... They got the win. That's all that matters. All right, now it's time to preview Cardinals-Rams. If the Cardinals are going to win this game, they need to double Cooper Cup on every single play. I'm not kidding. You cannot let him beat you. We know the Cup will go off. He has that playoff experience. Do we know that about the other Rams pass catchers? No. Van Jefferson wasn't great against the Packers. Six catches for 46 yards. I understand that he had a touchdown, but he wasn't great. Tyler Higby has no playoff success. Odell Beckham has no playoff success. One thing that we've learned in these playoffs is 
With the lights on bright, the newbies tend to fold. You think about all the quarterbacks that are in the next round. Joe Burrow, comfortable with the lights on bright. Just think about what he did at LSU. Ryan Tannehill got the Titans to an AFC title game a couple years ago. Jimmy Garoppolo got the Niners to a Super Bowl a couple years ago. Aaron Rodgers, former Super Bowl MVP. Josh Allen, perennially in the playoffs. Patrick Mahomes, former Super Bowl MVP. Tom Brady, the GOAT. I'm going into this game making other people kill me than Cooper Cup. You know, I want to see what Van Jefferson can do. I want to see what Higby can do. I want to see what Beckham can do. I'm not sold on any of those guys. I'm not saying they're bad players. They're not. But with the lights on bright, it's different. Also, J.J. Watt will be back for this game. That is huge for the Cardinals because he is their best defensive player. As for the Rams, I know they're going to be tempted to air the ball out a lot. But I'm not sure if that's the best way to go about this. See, I don't know how Matthew Stafford is going to play with the lights on bright. He's only started three playoff games. He's never won a playoff game. So I'm not saying you take away Stafford entirely, but I'd like the Rams to not go crazy. Go with a death-by-million-cuts approach. Keep the ball out of Kyler Murray's hands. Run the ball with Sonny Michelle. I really like him. At the end of the day, he has really good playoff experience. I really like that. And I know that I just said I'm not sold on Tyler Higby in the playoffs, but he's going to need to step up in this game. Because the Cardinals have no one, and I mean no one, that can stop him. Great receiving tight ends are such a mismatch. So go with death by a million cuts. Don't go crazy. I'm not saying you don't try to push the ball downfield. You've got to get Deshaun Jackson involved a little bit. But I'd like the Rams to go with more of a conservative approach. And also, their big guns on defense, Aaron Donald, Jalen Ramsey, and Von Miller, really need to step up. All in all, while I am skeptical of how Cliff Kingsbury will do in the playoffs, I don't think he's a great coach. I think he's a little overrated. I've got to be fair. He's certainly better than I thought he'd be coming out of USC. You know that Kyler Murray is going to get his. The Cardinals are probably the more well-rounded team. I went with all home teams over the weekend. I'm going to change that up here. Give me the Cardinals in the upset. Alright, so that's going to do it for today. Alright, that's going to do it for today. I want to keep today's show entirely focused on the NFL playoffs. There are some other things I want to talk about, but I'll do it tomorrow. That's okay, it won't be passe by then, I promise. Also, I'll have an interview for you tomorrow. Maya Washington will be on this show tomorrow. 
She's Gene Washington's daughter. Gene Washington is a former wide receiver for the Vikings and Broncos. Very good player, college football Hall of Famer. She wrote and directed a documentary about him called Through the Banks of the Red Cedar that has been turned into a book. So we'll be chatting about that. New York Islanders show comes your way tonight. Until next time, I'm Jacob Volk, and always remember, if you disagree with me, you're wrong.